So let me just give a brief introduction. Uh, Dr. Vic Pant is the Chief Science Advisor of NRPAN, the Natural Resources Canada Federal Ministry. Uh, he is one of seven departmental science advisors. So this is something that uh, Canada has been promoting following the UK, uh, New Zealand, other uh, nations. Uh, so it's a very major um, assignment that directly reporting to the deputy minister of the department. Vic is a specialist for data science and AI. And I'm in our can, I have to read this. He is responsible for accelerating the creative application of innovative digital technologies, including artificial intelligence, to enhance Enocan's ability to conduct research and analysis, as well as provide evidence-based policy advice that is supported by advanced analytical techniques. So that's all topics that are very interesting to us. I also, I would just like to mention that the growing importance of AI was recently emphasized by the new head of the NSF US, who wants to make AI a national priority. So it's great that, um, that we're on board. And uh, Vic just explained to me before the meeting that the budget is also um, emphasizing AI quantum technologies. So that is, is also, uh, so we're on board with this. And just to a last bit here, Vic holds a master's degree from Harvard University and University of London, and a PhD from the University of Toronto, where he's also an adjunct professor. He was nine years at Oracle, where he was the global lead for AI competitive intelligence, and he is also the founder of Canada Synthetic Intelligence Forum. So over to you, Vic. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. It's a, it's a pleasure to join colleagues on this uh, meeting and I hope this will be the first, uh, but certainly not the last of our interactions and partnerships. Uh, Mark, I'm going to try to share my screen if that's okay. Uh, if I can get permission to do so, then uh, I have yeah. a couple of slides. Yeah, I think I just should. gave you permission. Yeah, you should Thank be able you to. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Sydney. Great. Okay. So I'm going to quickly share my screen. Let me know if you can see my screen. Perfect. Thank you. So as uh, Mark uh, kindly mentioned in the introduction, one of my priorities at Natural Resources Canada is to accelerate the creative application of innovative digital technologies to advance the integration of our science and our policy endeavors and enterprises. So through this talk, I'm going to give you a bit of a snapshot of what that looks like, talk a little bit about our setup, a little bit about our partnerships, a little bit about our projects to give you an idea of, of how this is actually working in uh, from an aspirational, but also from an operational perspective. When we think about natural resources in Canada, uh, we can look at it from a macro perspective and we can say that Broadly speaking, natural resources sector in Canada directly or indirectly accounts for about 17% of Canada's nominal GDP, uh, is um, related to about 1.7 million jobs and exports that are pegged at over a quarter of a trillion dollars, comprising about 49% of our total merchandise exports. And you can think about the sector or the industry as comprised of energy, mining, oiling and gas, mining, oil and gas, as well as forestry. So that is natural resources in Canada. Now, NRCAN, the department where I have the privilege of working, uh, Natural Resources Canada is committed to improving the quality of life of Canadians by ensuring that our country's abundant natural resources are developed sustainably, competitively, and inclusively. When you think about Natural Resources Canada, uh, some folks may know this, others may, may not, but science and technology is central to our mandate. So we are a science-based economic department. Certainly uh, the industries and the sectors I just mentioned to you have a significant um, industry aspect to it and economic aspect to it. Uh, but those decisions that are made in a policy setting are deeply informed and influenced by the work of our science cadre. And we are proud to say that we are performers, users, funders and communicators of science and technology. And we have, uh, broadly speaking, over 2,000 employees that are focused day-to-day uh, -day on uh, SNT, science and technology, research and development, and with a budget of uh, over half a billion dollars uh, in all of the different uh, research that goes on related to NRCAN science and technology mission and mandate. We have a long history of scientific excellence. Uh, some of these uh, organizations that you see that are listed on this slide are a part of uh, Natural Resources Canada, and they uh, go 
way back. They are storied and historically significant institutions of scientific uh, uh, enterprise within Canada. Uh, if you look at the geological survey, you look at the Canadian Forest Service and its predecessor in the uh, Dominion Lands Branch, you look at the Canadian Center for Mapping and Earth Observation, and you see from coast to coast to coast how we have a strategic placement of various facilities and various uh, uh, various elements of these institutions uh, throughout the country. It really gives you an idea of the breadth, not just from a spatial perspective, but even from a temporal perspective of the, of the significance of our enterprise from a science and technology perspective. Now, uh, let's talk about the Digital Accelerator, which is, uh, which is the team that, that I manage within NRCAN. When we were started, we had four main goals, and, and we're still relatively new, especially if you compare us to the storied historical organizations I just shared with you. So we're only uh, 18 to 20 months old, if you want to look at it in that sort of uh, time horizon. Uh, we had four goals. And the one goal is the one that Mark kindly already uh, stated and mentioned, which is uh, creative applications of innovative digital technologies to accelerate science and policy integration. Now, uh, data science and artificial intelligence are a key part of that, but we also have to be in tune with beyond the horizon or avant-garde technologies, uh, which may not be practical today, but we certainly want to be ready in terms of our thinking and in terms of our planning to be able to take advantage of them and integrate them into our scientific enterprise in a meaningful way, such as quantum computing and, and, and derivatives of uh, technologies that evolve from quantum sciences. So that's an idea. How do we make sure that our policy, our science interface is benefiting from this rapid advancement in the field of digital solutions. And certainly I didn't say this explicitly, but data centric digital solutions. Another thing we are very mindful of is it's great to have a center of excellence. It's great to have this notion of communities of practice, uh, but we don't want knowledge to be siloed because in a large department of over 5,000 employees with about over 2000 employees focusing on science and technology, uh, we certainly want to have people that are experts in those targeted digital technologies, uh, but we also want to make sure that there is a general awareness of and an appreciation and a comfort level with the potential of these technologies writ large throughout our department. So if you think about it, knowledge diffusion, knowledge sharing, and just collaborative learning and transfer learning among all colleagues. So to say that we want to collectively elevate the, the digital quotient or the digital acumen, the data quotient or the data acumen of all of our colleagues uh, who play such an important role in advancing our, our department forward. The next thing is, I always like to say, nobody knows everything and everybody knows something. So the field of digital solutions, even if you narrow down and you look at AI, and even if you narrow down and you look just at natural language processing versus uh, computational vision versus reinforcement learning and control and neurodynamic programming, each of these areas is not only interconnected and those interconnections are evolving very rapidly, but in fact, each of those areas by themselves are also growing uh, at, at unprecedented paces. I mean, the rate of acceleration is itself accelerating if one can say that. So it, it's not possible for us to say that we're going to know every single thing about all these digital technologies at all times. So how do we enter into strategic partnerships with, for instance, the University of Ottawa or with private sector institutions or with research institutes, which could be public private partnerships and really just make sure that we bring value to the table and that we can also benefit from some of the complementarities and the synergies which are co-created when organizations come together to engage on projects of joint and mutual interest. And then the last part of it is also governance. This is important. I call this capability. You can call this leadership. We can call this governance that we want to do this in a way. We want our accelerator to operate in a way where it doesn't just remain a pilot. It doesn't just remain a prototype. It doesn't just remain a proof of concept. Yes, the experiments we do and the exploration of the suite of problem spaces and the solution spaces is is focused on prototypes, pilots, and, and, and proofs of concept, proofs of principle, but we want to do this in a scalable way. And we want to do this in a sustainable way, in a resilient way. So governance is very important. Ensuring that leaders across our enterprise have clear line of sight, and indeed leaders across the government of Canada have some degree of visibility into the work that we're doing, our decision rationales, our pipelines, our challenges, our, our sort of opportunities, so that collectively the organization as a whole, the government as a whole, has a stake in our success. And we can also share some of the knowledge and the insights with colleagues from 
our department, but certainly from across the other departments. So these are the four pillars. And today in this talk, I'm going to give you some vignettes of what we've done and what we plan to do in each of these pillars with some concrete examples. Now, let's zoom in a little bit on data science and artificial intelligence, because as I said, when we talk about digital acceleration, digital solutions, this is not just AI or data science. I mean, certainly you can think about Internet of Things, you can think about ubiquitous computing, you can think about big data, you can think about cloud computing, you can think about uh, you know other, other concepts like blockchain and distributed ledgers. But I'm going to focus right now on data science and artificial intelligence because we've made a lot of progress in this space and the results are already starting to show for themselves. So some of the areas where, as you can imagine, uh, for a department like ours, where data science and AI play a critical role is in, for instance, predicting the spread of groundwater or estimating the spread of wildfires and forest fires or modeling the yield of energy uh, in, in different types of uh, locations and regions and also approximating the infestation of invasive species. So by no means am I saying that these are the only areas as I'll show you in my presentation where we apply artificial intelligence and data science techniques and tools to to uh, surface insights from information. But these are some areas which I think um, are, are quite relatable and everybody can understand how it is that we would be applying those bottom up learners, those learners that learn from samples and, in, and uh, instances and observations uh, to create these generalized or more abstract representations to support forecasting and prediction and future decision making. Now, our data science team is quite, um, quite capable from a technical perspective and from a functional perspective. So from a technical perspective, we have a number of uh, highly skilled mathematician uh, colleagues. Uh, we have statisticians, we have computer scientists, we have folks with background in information science. My own training is in information science. So we have folks that bring an ensemble of capabilities to the table so that we have a well-rounded team that can tackle any kind of problem that sort of is presented to us. Um, as I mentioned before, I mean, certainly the field is expanding so quickly and the field is growing so quickly that even though we have a very well-rounded team, we're always on the lookout for talent because uh, as I mentioned, uh, there's, there's, you know, you can always have uh, smart people in your team that can really make, uh, make an impact on the projects you're doing. But in addition to the data science and the AI resources we have, we also have some very strong policy leaders and we can call them uh, corporate leads or organizational leads because I think it's important for any such initiative like the digital accelerator to certainly have the core capability, the core competence in terms of the technology, but we also need to have the institutional embeddedness. We also need to have the connections with the folks that have come from within the department or at least more broadly within the government to ensure that, that there are interties, that there are connections between the sectors, the directorates, the branches, the, the different uh, teams that we all manage within our department as a whole. So we also have a number of uh, excellent colleagues uh, that, that continue to do great work from that perspective, from a policy interface, a corporate or an institutional or an enterprise interface. And this way, we're able to make sure that our data science and AI and our digital solutions teams can be very nicely aligned with the priorities and the plans of our department at a macro level. Now, if we go back a little bit, uh, you know, long before the digital accelerator ever came along, Natural Resources Canada and our, and our teams have, have really exhibited exemplary leadership in the field of machine learning and artificial intelligence for decades, quite literally decades. So here are some papers going all the way back to the mid 1990s where researchers from the Canadian Forest Service were already applying computer vision uh, techniques to solve the types of scientific problems that they were they were dealing with at the time. So you can see a method for enhancing tree species proportions from aerial photos or optical remote sensing techniques for the assessment of forest inventory and biophysical parameters, and then a comparison of possible multispectral classification schemes for tree crowns individually delineated of high spatial resolution MEIS images. So you can see that much before sort of the AI and the data science tsunami took the popular press and the mainstream media by storm, uh, Canadian Forest Service scientists from more than 25 uh, years ago, we're, we're using these kinds of technologies in a, in a very productive way. And not only were they using techniques around computer vision, but they were also applying sequence learning techniques, uh, temporal learning techniques also to solve the type times of uh, the types of uh, time horizon sensitive problems uh, that they were dealing with from a scientific perspective. So very, very exciting and interesting contributions being made by CFS researchers going, uh, going many, many uh, decades back. 
at the same time, if you look at the geological survey of Canada, same thing there. So you can see a paper here from the 1995, I believe, which was uh, a neural network approach for geological uh, mapping, a technical background in case study. So here they were using um, neural network architectures to, to learn classifiers, to do different type of categorization tasks. And what's interesting is that, you know, now uh, deep learning is sort of the main paradigm when we talk about artificial neural networks. But back then they were not using really deep multi-layer networks, but they were using these types of um, neural network approaches nonetheless to, to make advances and to make progress in their respective fields. And since then, uh, our GSE scientists have continued to apply those types of techniques and publish papers. So when the digital accelerator team came along uh, from that perspective, it was almost more of like a force amplifier, a force multiplier, where we were surge capacity, where we already had a lot of beyond the horizon thinking going on in Enercan for decades around how do we take some of these breakthrough algorithms, these breakthrough advances in high performance computing and the ever growing data sets and all of the interesting software tooling and the, and the software stack that comes along to bring all this together. Uh, but in fact, then we also are now supporting my team in a number of these exciting initiatives. So lots of great stuff. You know, It's good to work in an organization where already the absorptive capacity exists, uh, where the knowledge and the awareness exists so that we can all kind of come together and, and benefit uh, to advance these scientific projects in the right way. I'll give you a couple of concrete examples, which uh, my team has been working on very closely with partners from throughout the Enercan family, and in some case, in many cases, actually even outside of the Enercan family. So this is uh, an interesting project called Geo Deep Learning, which is a project that broadly falls within the remit of Earth observation. And here the goal was to segment satellite imagery to assign land cover classes to pixels. So we have satellite imagery that comes into Canadian Center for Mapping and Earth Observation. And uh, wouldn't that be a great use case to take some of the state of the art machine vision algorithms, com computational vision algorithms to extract features from these images. So these images are coming in. We have a supervised data set that contains mappings down to the pixel level of various different types of things. This is the top of a road. This is the top of a building? Is it the top of a tree? Is it the top of a water body? You name it. So once we have those annotated samples, then we can train a supervised learning classification classifier or categorization algorithm. And then we can apply it to these images. And then we can uh, really generate a lot of insights from that type of raw pixel information as it's coming downstream off of the satellites. Now, this uh, project, certainly as you can imagine, it has implications for Canada, but also it has implications beyond Canada. And so what we've done is this is actually now open source and, and the government has a commitment to open science and open data. So certainly when there is a, an initiative where uh, it can benefit not just Canada, but also from a, a more global community writ large, then this is something that folks can actually go to GitHub, which is a code repository for collaborative software development. And they can access our GDL project, which is maintained by our colleagues and led by the Canadian Center of Mapping and Earth Observation. And you can look at the architecture, you can look at the design choices, you can look at the configuration, you can download the code. If you can optimize the code or improve it in some way, you can submit a, 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 you know, a request and then it can be reviewed by the moderator. So it's a really uh, value co-creation model, even at a sort of crowdsource level. Uh, but also, as I just mentioned, it's something that can benefit lots of nations and lots of peoples. So why not put this out there where, uh, where not only can they benefit from it, but they also have an opportunity to contribute to it and we can all collectively make it better. So that's, um, you know, if you're interested in this kind of work, please take a look at this code and we actually document the type of algorithms we use and our decision rationale and our data engineering pipelines and things like that. And it's quite exciting work. Another project that my team did is uh, with the Canadian Forest Service. So as I mentioned before, uh, both CCMEO, CFS and GSC and all of our other scientific uh, teams already have a, a very high understanding of artificial intelligence and the possibilities and capabilities of data science. So one of them is certainly CFS, where a number of different uh, applications of AI are being pioneered and innovated. Uh, one of them was quite interesting, where our CFS colleagues had a longitudinal data set of tree core tree ring core sample data. And these data were actually uh, sort of collected by various means and methods, and they were collected by different uh, different uh, folks at different times using different degrees of, uh, of instrumentation and so on and so forth. So these data are, are, are sort of intermixed together. And uh, these data are then being used to make policy decisions uh, in insights from those and then analysis of those data are informing policy choices. And so 
uh, our scientists who are leading this initiative from the Canadian Forest Service were interested in using some kind of a data mining technique to separate the data sets, the subsets of data within that broad data set according to their quality, using some sort of a measure of quality. And so my team actually worked with them to segment the overall data set into subsegments based on sort of uh, proximity or similarity conceptual similarity, if you will, or representational similarity to some golden archetypes of data, and then be able to separate out those segments of data by quality, and then be able to then include or exclude different of those quality labeled subsets from a large data set in different policy analyses. So very exciting project where it wasn't necessarily, our team wasn't working on the application of machine learning to uh, let's say train a classifier or a, or a regressor or something like that, or a clustering engine just to, uh, to, to, to power some kind of a scientific experiment. It was done to actually improve the quality of the data that were then going to be analyzed downstream for the, uh, for the scientific uh, project that those data were going to be mapped to. So anomaly detection, outlier detection, uh, data cleansing, master data identification, those kinds of things. So very, very interesting uh, project we did with our colleagues from CFS. Another project we're working on is with our energy technology sector. As you know, the government has a commitment to building a network of electric vehicles from coast to coast to coast. So how do we know where to put those electric charging vehicles? We certainly don't want to put them equidistant throughout the country because that is not how people that own electric vehicles or that live or where they work or the routes they take to go from where they live to where they work and back and so on and so forth. So we have lots of data. We have data about uh, grids. We have data about people's purchasing of electric vehicles. We have data about people's charging behaviors. We have uh, understanding about sort of at a, at, not at an individual level, but at, an, at a population level where it is that, uh, you know, different uh, clusters of, of, of electric vehicles are owned and where they're driven and so on and so forth. Again, at a macro level, not down to an individual level. So can we use that to make some inferences about where these uh, where these charging stations need to go because certainly it's not just a question of having them close to where the people that uh, own the vehicles and where they work and how they drive and all of those but we also need to make sure we keep into mind the electricity aspects of it or the power aspects of it as well, right? Because you need to have these uh, charging stations at places where you can get access to them through transformers and substations, ultimately through a grid. So the power can keep flowing to them so that folks, when they plug their vehicles, can actually get a steady supply of electricity or power to charge their batteries and their electric vehicles. So again, a very interesting project where we are able to work with a number of departments such as Transport Canada, Statistics Canada, Environment and Climate Change Canada. So truly a team lift across the government of Canada to be able to enable uh, if you will, a recommender engine, if you will, of this sort to, to do this kind of very real world uh, suggesting of where these, uh, uh, where these uh, charging stations ought to go. Another project that we're working on is with our low carbon energy sector. This is what we call the Energy Star Detective. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Energy Star logo. Uh, it, is a, it is a logo that gives customers the peace of mind that the uh, appliance that they're buying or the item they're purchasing, washing machine, refrigerator, dishwasher, uh, something of that kind, that it, it is Energy Star compliant, which is a set of rules and very uh, you know clear guidelines on, on how that appliance or item has to behave from an electrical consumption and utilization perspective. Uh, but the thing is that you know a lot of times uh, on online websites or on the public internet, people sometimes uh, may not be using the logo in the right way or might be sort of uh, uh, not portraying uh, their product in the right way or maybe misleading the way that they are linking their product to an Energy Star certification. So, so manually checking that on every possible website where an Energy Star device may be advertised for sale or uh, for lease uh, is, is not feasible. So uh, our team is actually currently working with the low carbon energy sector team on an Energy Star detective. We're using a combination of an AI powered spider or a crawler that goes out over the internet and tries to find out places where in text or in images, Energy Star is being ascribed to a product uh, can then be compared against a data set of actually Energy Star certified appliances and items. And in case there's a mismatch for some reason, it can flag that as a work item that then a human inspector can further investigate. And, and it really, as you can imagine, it's first of all, not a possible problem to solve from a uh, human perspective by ourselves. So this is where technology such as an AI powered spider coupled with a text text analysis engine coupled with a computational vision engine can be brought together to help uh, ensure that these programs are being run in, a, in the proper way. So a couple of quick examples of the types of projects our teams are working on. Some are 
very directly tied to policy. Some are very directly tied to programs. And, and really, we try to have in our team an ensemble, a blend that represents a healthy balance of all of these, uh, all of the different priority areas, uh, whether they're programs, whether they're policy priorities, and so on and so forth. Now, that was kind of the vignette into the first pillar. And, and I took a bit more time there because that's really where, if you will, the bits and bytes sort of get real. The bits and bytes meets the dollars and cents, if you will. Uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit now more about the culture piece as well. As I mentioned to you, uh, we can have a team of data scientists and artificial intelligence experts, and more broadly, if you will, digital solution architects writ large that are experts at what they do. But the impact for the department as a whole will remain kind of narrow and, 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 and minor uh, if th those are the only people that have a true understanding and awareness of, of the true power and potential of digital technologies to accelerate the integration of science and policy. So culture is very important. So what, what my team did in conjunction with lots of other teams across NRCAN was to launch a number of cultural initiatives. Uh, you can think about training, you can think about communities of practice within NRCAN, but also partnering with existing communities of practice outside of NRCAN within the Government of Canada family. Uh, you can talk about participating in events and sessions like the Canadian uh, Digital uh, Panel or the Canadian Science Policy Conference, uh, linking up with experts, which I'll talk about more in the partnership uh, piece as well. Uh, but really just making sure that the message gets out. Not everybody is, a, is you know, interested to become an AI scientist or a, or a data uh, science expert, but just to have this safe, inclusive, welcoming space where people that have a curiosity, people that have that uh, kind of a desire to learn more about the potential and the pitfalls, the opportunities and the challenges uh, associated with the technology such as AI or data science, that there's a safe, inclusive, welcoming space in our department for everybody to come to, irrespective of their technical level in that field, to benefit as a collective. So really been working well. One of the initiatives we have that is not just within NRCAN, but more broadly, is actually the Synthetic Intelligence Forum, which we launched uh, in Ottawa. And these pictures are from before the COVID lockdown happened, but we had a researcher from uh, University of Ottawa, we had a researcher from GSC, and a researcher from a private or a practitioner from a private sector company who came together and talked about their experiences with AI. Uh, we had a similar uh, session where we had uh, folks from different government departments who came and talked about the importance of governance of, of data for AI. So we had a colleague from our uh, central agency, which is the BCO. We had a colleague from another central agency, which is the Treasury Board. And then we had a colleague at the time from ECCC, who is now at the Department of National Defense. So, so we, we have these types of, uh, if you will, communities of, of knowledge sharing and transfer learning and collaborative learning where folks could really come together and, and ex exchange good ideas with each other. Since the COVID lockdown, we've now started doing these events uh, you know, on the internet because we can't really meet in, in, in the same room any longer. And so you can see here that for instance, we had, had the privilege of having the interim chief technology officer of the government of Canada come and talk uh, on our channel. The recording is available. And then after that, we had another session. We've had a number of sessions. I'm just using a couple of examples. We had representatives from the Pan-Canadian AI strategy Institutes, uh, the Alberta Machine Int Intelligence Institute, the Quebec Institute for Learning Algorithms, and the Vector Institute in Toronto come and share their insights about keys for developing an AI strategy. So as you can imagine, you know, some folks which are very technical, they are more interested in the technology aspects of digital solutions, but folks that are more on the policy side or the enterprise or the corporate side or the organizational side, they may be more interested more in the use cases or the value propositions or the costs and benefits. Uh, so we try to create events and, and create a space for these creative collisions of ideas for folks at all different levels of knowledge and all different levels of interest as well. I'm going to talk a little bit about strategic partnerships as well now. I think that's important to talk about. And partnerships can mean many different things. And, and that's exactly what we take to mean with it. Some partnerships are more narrow. Some partnerships are more broader. So some partnerships may involve more of a uh, data relationship. In other cases, it may be data plus expertise. In other cases, it may be data plus expertise, plus software, plus other aspects of the relationship. So we take a very broad sort of approach and we want to get to win-win. That's sort of our um, 
focus here is that not everybody is going to want to partner with us in exactly the same sort of uh, same way. So we just we want to be flexible. I mean, we have certain needs. We have a lot to offer. Organizations on the other side have a lot of needs and a lot to offer. So let's try to come together. Let's try to forge a consensus on what looks like win-win. And these are some of the organizations with which we already have uh, some very, very strong relationships with, which I'll, which I'll share with you briefly. So this is uh, an example of an Enercan and Microsoft partnership. Uh, at your leisure, you are uh, referred to these, uh, these uh, news items, which, which came out, for instance, in the Hell Times, uh, leveraging artificial intelligence to build a more sustainable Canada, where our partner Microsoft uh, talked about the projects which we are collaborating with them on. And that's truly a relationship where we actually go beyond just software. We look into the data, we look into the expertise, we look into all other aspects of resourcing as well. And, and you can see uh, more details if you also look at on the Enercan website where we highlight uh, some of the critical aspects of this partnership. In terms of partnerships with research institutes, I, I have a couple of logos which I showed you earlier, but specifically, this is a very interesting research partnership we have with the University of Toronto, where they had done some, uh, some groundbreaking and pioneering work on essentially uh, the mapping the design characteristics of machine learning systems or data science systems with organizational objectives and goals. And this is obviously a very, very important priority, not just for NRCAN, but all organizations because uh, artificial intelligence and data science projects are quite expensive in terms of data acquisition costs, talent retention costs, in terms of all the costs of actually the compute and the productionizing of the models and all the governance and regulation that goes into that. So we wanted to make sure that we had that added benefit of having an interpretive lens, if you will, a scaffolding through which to analyze the proposals of machine learning and data science projects that weren't just at the project level, but actually explicitly mapped back to the strategic mandate and the mission of our department. So working closely with them, working closely with other partners and very eager to also explore partnership opportunities with the University of Ottawa to see where we could uh, take our collective knowledge to the next level. And last but not the least, I'm going to touch a little bit about Enercan AI governance. As I mentioned to you, we can do all the projects in the world. We can have all the partnerships in the world. We can do all the sort of um, knowledge sharing and, and, and transfer learning that we want to do. But at the end of the day, to have legitimacy, to have that confidence of our leadership cadre, to have the trust of our executives at all levels of the enterprise and also of our, of our colleagues at every level in the department, uh, we need to operate the digital accelerator like a white box or like a glass glass box, if you will, not like a not like an opaque box where sort of things are going in and things are getting done and outputs are coming out, but nobody quite knows how things are happening. And so we've taken completely the opposite approach to that, where uh, we represent the digital accelerator at the appropriate governance committees in our department. Uh, we regularly brief our, our um, leadership team on what we are up to, where the resources are being spent, how we're prioritizing proposals which come through, how we're managing the formation and the, and the development of new partnerships and relationships, just to make sure that everybody knows what we are doing and how we're actually progressing the mission and the vision of the accelerator in a way that, as I mentioned before, is, is, is scalable and it's sustainable. So yes, even though we focus on pilots and prototypes and proofs of concepts and proofs of principles when they come to the actual projects, but we want the accelerator itself to be something that withstands the test of time, is robust, is resilient, and can truly branch out in multiple different uh, directions. And, and certainly, uh, you know, also be able to uh, benefit as we already are now doing through our partnerships with other government departments, those departments that may actually want to partner with us and, and sort of use some of our learnings and our lessons from the accelerator as well. So, all of this also fits within the overall rubric of the broader Government of Canada AI governance. I'm sure folks are familiar with the uh, algorithmic impact assessment tool, which is a very useful tool. You can go take a look at it on you know, the public internet. And what the tool basically does is it asks you questions about a particular data mining or data science or machine learning type project that you may be contemplating. You answer a series of questions and it gives you a risk rating. And you can look at some risk mitigation measures to ensure that the data or the insights from the information that will be coming out of your models uh, are, are consistent with the, with the ideals, the values, the norms, attitudes, and beliefs uh, enshrined in, in, for example, the directive on automated decision making. So that's also a filter that my team applies throughout all of our uh, work that we do, because um, in the government, we, we have to be responsible and we have to be accountable for the higher level protocols in place uh, to ensure that the work we're doing abides by and complies with uh, by, by the uh, directives that, that are relevant. In this case, for instance, the directive on automated decision making and a tool like the algorithmic impact assessment really makes it, I think, easier for everybody to, to, to put those directive more 
more into practice. So with that, I want to have plenty of time for Q&A. I'm going to stop right here, Mark, uh, but that's our website. You're most welcome to come uh, take a look at the website. There's different sections there. And here I'm showing our partnerships and about us. So you can learn a bit more about our team at your leisure, but also our partnerships kind of highlight some of the private pa partnerships, public partnerships and the public private partnerships we have, and uh, also gives you details about our projects. So if you're interested to partner with us from a macro perspective, or you want to uh, partner with us on a specific project, we're more than happy to to, uh, to speak with you and happy to take this conversation uh, to the next level. So thank you so much for your time and, and your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Vic. That was really incredibly inspiring and interesting. You, you covered so much in uh, very efficiently, and uh, there are so many uh, contact points, you know, with work we do, we are interested in. So this, uh, this will be a very great uh, starting point for discussion. So I propose that um, the audience will use the hand tool. So if you go down on Zoom on the reactions, raise hand, that's probably the easiest way for me to manage questions. So please, uh, please feel free. I, uh, I actually, let me lead on with one question, Rick. Um, you know, I've worked on, on governance and also issues of ethics and governance is hard, but you also have as your second priority to change culture, you know, in a, you say we have an acceleration of the acceleration <laughs> that usually overwhelms human beings and their culture. So I'm just curious, do you feel this is a place where you really make progress, where it's really feasible to change the culture of an entire enormous department? Mark, I think that's a fabulous question. And thank you so much for, for giving me the chance to reflect on that. I think if I unpack my answer to that question, I'd like to do it at two levels uh, with your kind permission. So the first is, Mark, that how do we even measure cultural change? So, you know, there's a famous saying, you can't manage what you can't measure. Uh, so the first question is, you know, when we do projects, so I walked you through a series of projects that we did, and you can always say, you know, okay, we've done five projects in six months, and yes, not all projects are equal, but we can always map that project to its sort of uh, rank in our sort of ensemble or portfolio of projects. So you can use some kind of proxy to measure that. But culture is much, much harder to measure because it's more diffused, it's more personal, it's more implicit, it's more, if you will, uh, tacit in a lot of ways. Uh, that being said, I think, we can use some, if you will, more um, observational type techniques to, to make some informed judgment. So perhaps they won't withstand the test of rigor in terms of validity for, you know, how scientifically accurate those measurements are. But, you know, I think even, for instance, when we organize these knowledge sharing sessions and we're tracking attendance over time, are we seeing a growth in that attendance? Are we seeing the same people coming back again and again? Are we seeing them bring their colleagues with them? Uh, coincident with these cultural activities, are we also then seeing and commensurate uptick in the number of proposals we are receiving for the projects? Are we seeing an increase in the, if you will, technical finesse and the proficiency of those projects themselves? So I think that, you know, you're exactly right, Mark, is it's very hard to, first of all, how, before we say, you know, is it even possible to change culture? I guess the first thing is, how do you measure that you're changing culture? Uh, in my case, you know, once you, we can figure that out, once we can come to an agreement that, okay, we know there's no hard measure, there are a few soft measures that we can build into some kind of a meta measure. Uh, certainly in that direction, Mark, I'm happy to report that we are actually trending in the right direction. So the interest we are seeing in the work of the accelerator, the awareness we're seeing, uh, the uh, projects we are seeing, not just the quantity, but the quality of the proposals, um, a lot of the sort of parallel initiatives to the accelerator we're seeing where work similar to the accelerator is being done outside the accelerator in the department. That is all heartening to us, uh, Mark, because it certainly reflects an elevation in the overall collective digital acumen and digital quotient of our department. I hope uh, that answers your question, Mark. I know that that's really interesting. And it strikes me that this and, and also other examples you brought, like the Energy Star automation, checking, you know, re really regulatory enforcement, how uh, transferable these things are, yeah. you know across departments like internationally even so that that is also exciting so i would like to leave the floor to uh, my colleagues uh, with any question on on Vic's talk or uh, on uh, relationships ideas please go ahead Tony, you have to uh, put, put on your uh, microphone, please. Yeah. yeah. I should uh, maybe just make in for your benefit, uh, 
uh, Dr. Levkovich is the, uh, the founder of the Canadian Permafrost Association, is a long-standing uh, force in the department, also the former dean of our faculty. Thank you, Mark, for that. Um, yes, I try to forget that. Um, Vic, <laughs> thank you for an interesting presentation um, with many, many components. So I'm, I actually wanted to follow up on, I had a very similar question to Mark's. Um, we recently uh, approved a strategic plan uh, for the Canadian Permafrost Association and some of your um, uh, colleagues in NRCAN in the Geological Survey are actually quite heavily involved, including Sharon Smith, Brendan O'Neill, Steve Wolf. there's a whole group of permafrost scientists there. And one of the things, um, I, I had a fairly big hand in writing that, that uh, plan, and one of the things I really wanted was to make sure that the association, which is new, can we would know whether we had succeeded or not. So we put in metrics um, that can be tracked over the next five years. Um, the uh, committee that, that figured that out said, okay, what are our targets for the number of members, the targets for the number of indigenous people, um, everything from diversity of the membership through to um, achievements in terms of products. So the question I have for you is, uh, so I could tell you today, what will represent success for the CPA in five years time? What represents success for your digital accelerator in five years time? Let's say we take five years, because that's kind of invisible. 10 years is perhaps too far out, but five years, what, what would you see as success uh, for your group? Certainly, uh, and, and, and pleasure to meet you, Professor uh, uh, Levkowitz, and it's a, it's a privilege to make your acquaintance. Uh, certainly, I'm familiar with the Permafrost Association and the great partnership with NRCAN, so happy to, happy to see that evolve and, and mature over time. That's a great question. You know, the way I look at it is certainly the further out we sort of expand the time horizon of where it is we're trying to assess success, uh, the less it becomes about uh, the sort of hard quantitative objective measures, and by necessity, it becomes more of a subject in my mind, more of a qualitative assessment, simply because the future is essentially unknowable. Aspirationally, we have certain goals, uh, for sure. Uh, I would definitely say, uh, in a more quantitative sense, uh, we would like to be able to increase the number of projects that we are doing, recognizing that not all projects are alike, but we want to see an upward trend year over year in the number of projects that we are successfully delivering to our clients. So at the end of the five-year mark, uh, we certainly would like to have a number that we can hit and say, look, these are the projects that we were able to successfully influence or impact or contribute to in close partnership with the champions of those projects from the sectors and the labs respectively. I think the second piece of it would be, as I was mentioning to Mark, and, and I'm glad you sort of mentioned the intertie to, of your question to Mark's question is, uh, is very similar is, uh, you know, what kind of thought leadership are we observing peripherally, but also more directly in the conversations, uh, which one could say are more social, but even in the more, if you will, codified and documented artifacts coming out of Enercan. So for instance, when papers are being published by our scientists, where in the past there was perhaps a certain percentage of scientists that were using state-of-the-art techniques, uh, has that number actually gone up? Um, for instance, what about the nature of partnership? So I would say, you know, those, those four or five pillars which I shared, uh, success to me would actually be a multivariate optimization type uh, situation where I'll say, okay, on the project side, uh, here's what success looks like on, in five years, culture, partnerships, and then governance. And at, at a high level, I'll just uh, conclude by saying, uh, for me, it'll be great if we can see that the accelerator now is the essence of the accelerator is diffused throughout our enterprise, where just as much as people know to call IT if they have some issue or they know to call HR or finance or legal, if they have a very technical or a very specialized need in a domain, that they can reach out to the digital accelerator. And part of it is awareness, but part of it is absorptive capacity. Part of it is also the fact that the, the ability to actually think about projects where we could play a role. And, and also making sure that as other departments in the, in the government of Canada are starting starting up their own digital accelerator, to me, success would look like where some of our partnerships, which are the first of their kind in the government of Canada, that they have also benefited from some of those relationships. So when we partnered with Microsoft or Google or Vector Institute or somebody else, uh, and it took us a certain amount of time because relationships had to be agreed to and terms and conditions had to be negotiated. But 
in the future now, other departments should be able to accelerate their time to partnership uh, that. So I know it's a bit of a, a broader answer because five years is kind of a long time horizon when we talk about digital technologies, but it's a very important question because for us, uh, we have to execute on that local space, which is you know day to day, week to week, month to month. But as you very correctly, as your question implies, we have this bigger goal of uh, what we can measure or what we can impute from as reasonable proxies for each of those pillars, what does success look like for us five years from now? It'll just be showing more of a trend of continual growth on all of the positive markers in those four pillars. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. So anyone else, and please students also take the opportunity. This is a, a good opportunity to ask about how to tap into Enocan and how how to make a career out of your uh, profession in geography or in environmental studies. Any other questions? I think Mark, if I may just quickly comment with your permission on your on your remark, I think you made an excellent remark. Uh, it's interesting, I've heard colleagues at CCMEO say that everything happens somewhere. So I think, you know, we started the conversation talking about maps and cartography and just the importance of uh, geospatial projections of information of interest. Uh, you know, nowadays it's uh, people take for granted uh, maps. Uh, in the sense you can have a mobile phone, you can have a smart watch, you can have a, a, a kiosk somewhere, at least when we were, uh, were going outside, you have laptops, tablets, maps are ubiquitous in a way. It's almost sort of like uh, people now uh, can do a text-based search in a search engine of their choice, but quite often those search results are not portrayed just as a listing of, of, of items you click on, a little vignette of a map shows up on the side mark. So to some extent, uh, you know, I think the, the skill that you touched on or the, or the area of focus you touched on mark is, uh, you know, geography and cartography and sort of maps uh, that has become so crucial now in all aspects of decision-making science, policy, corporate, organizational, uh, that absolutely we're, we're, we're very willing to benefit from your thought leadership and the thought leadership of all the folks on this call to partner with you. We have a lot to offer. We know you have a lot to offer and we're just looking for a synergetic complementary uh, win-win relationship with, with all of you. Well, thank you. There is an ongoing discussion among chairs of geography departments of the United States and there is a bit of a feeling that geography is, that people no longer know what geographers actually do. Uh, that there's this view, you know, we have, you have the maps, we have Google Maps, so why do we still need you? <laughs> so it's really good for us if, um, what's, if the content of current geography is being, uh, is made clear to people, you know, the value. And of course, once you add something like AI, people will understand that it's a modern thing. Uh, Sydney, please. Hey, Vic, um, thanks for your presentation. It was super interesting. Um, you talked a little bit about silos and I guess division of research. So in our department, we have three sort of streams, geography, environment, and geomatics. And we talk a lot about the, the sort of separation between them. So I'm just wondering like, what advice do you have for our department, but also just graduate students for how to make our research more intersectional and less divided, I guess. Thank you, thank you, Sydney. That's a that's a very uh, astute question, and uh, the way I'd like to answer it is something that we've been doing in our department very successfully. I'd like to say, and I've seen other federal departments do the same, is really looking at the so what in addition to the what, right? Because domain specialty and domain expertise really focuses on the what, right? So you want to become an expert and you want to know more and more about a particular topic or a subject and the more knowledge you accumulate, the more of an expert you become in that. I think one of the things that, while well, aspirationally it has been said, I'm sure in all organizations that horizontality is great and inter ties are great and how do we become more uh, sort of internally integrated, uh, but doing that becomes a bit tricky because just like with the culture conversation and culture certainly plays a role in that too, how do you operationalize that? So one thing our department has done very successfully uh, and, and certainly very proud of that is to really ground our goal of horizontality or our goal of strategic interties and interwork between all of our uh, sectors and all our branches, directorates and pillars is actually to ground this intention on a problem. 
And the problem is essentially something that is driven by a policy priority or a science mandate or something of that kind. So when you think about, for instance, and you mentioned, for instance, climate change, that's a great example. When you think about climate change, sure, you can have people that are experts in climate change from a policy perspective or even from a science perspective. Uh, but climate change, if you look at it, even from a science perspective, involves folks from multiple scientific disciplines, from volcanology to stratigraphy to uh, atmospheric physics to uh, computational fluid dynamics and all these different areas, computer science, information science. So, you know, in theory, everybody from all of these areas would like to say, hey, look, you know, we need to work together and we need to kind of come together. But unless there is that organizing imperative, unless there is that kind of coalescing function somewhere out there, it really becomes more aspirational and operational. So what we have found is a critical file such as climate change that has truly brought the best of our department to bear uh, from a science perspective, from a policy, from a corporate perspective, where now it doesn't really matter what sector you're from. Uh, if you are contributing to this file, whether it's climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, climate change rem remediation, it's a climate change from some other kind of analytic viewpoint, uh, you bring the folks together, that is the central organizing problem in that case. And we have other problems as well, uh, even when you think about I want to, so that's one part of the answer. The other part, very quickly, I want to touch on is Mark talked about the importance of, 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 of relation correlation between knowledge in one area and another area. And I fully agree with that. You know, if you think about this notion of uh, making AI models of flood water, right, or groundwater. Now, if you're on the other side making uh, computational models of how forest fires and wildfires spread. Now, yes, they are two different physical phenomena, but is there some relevance? And in machine learning, there is a term for this called transfer learning, where you take a model trained on one data set and then you partially retrain that model on a different data set. And perhaps it leads to more robustness. It leads to more numerical stability. It leads to more generalizability or better representational learning. Uh, so, so that's the second part of my answer is that one part certainly is the, I think the, the main part is you have to ground this aspiration to want to be horizontally integrated into a centrally driving imperative, which I give you an example. But I think the second piece of it is from a technical perspective, now AI and data science are offering us pathways, even at a more kind of lower level in terms of operationals, uh, be able to take knowledge from one domain and transfer it to another domain, take data from one domain, transfer it to another domain, and really build those relationships organically. So it's a combination of top-down intentional purposeful action, as well as a lot of um, ground up organic uh, collaboration uh, happening at the same time. Hope that answers your question, Sydney. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. That was a great answer. Thank you, Vic. Thank you, Vic. So we just have uh, four minutes left. Okay. So the last question has to come from uh, Mike Savada. Okay. Please, Mike. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Vic. I enjoyed your presentation very much. I, I was most interested um, in asking you some, maybe a technical question, which you may or may not be able to answer. Uh, regarding the, um, uh, the segmentation you did, or at least the example you showed on a slide, you showed a uh, Collins Bay Marina in Kingston, that region. Yes, um, yes. And I was, and you open sourced that, it's on GitHub, but I didn't have a chance to look at it. So I was wondering okay. um, what type of segmentation algorithm did you use, or I should say architecture? Did you use an off the shelf ar ar architecture that was then just uh, um, uh, transfer, use transfer learning approach for that, or did you build it from scratch? That's, uh, that's actually a great question, Michael, and uh, thank you for asking that question. So uh, I believe what you'll find on GitHub, and, and GitHub changes quite a bit because it's a very active community there. Uh, I believe what we have is, a, is an instance of a Turnaus net and a UU net. Uh, more broadly, I think when our teams were working on which one to actually put out and which one to start testing in production, we tested a whole suite of different computer vision algorithms. So everything from VGG to uh, we tried um, the Inception Net, we tried ResNet, we tried MobileNet, and I believe at the end what the team sort of uh, kind of landed on was Turnaus Net and UU Net. That being said, I think there's a lot of hyperparameter tuning which is going on currently. So our team, uh, although we've put something out on GitHub. On on the, in the background, our teams are actually working with a whole suite of configurations and architectures of these computer vision algorithms. Happy to have a more detailed conversation with you on this, uh, Michael. But I think for now, what you'll find on GitHub is an instance of a uh, Turnaus net and UU net. And, and, the, and, the, and the training data, is that also available? 
Uh, so the training data, I would certainly encourage you to contact us because of the file sizes and also some of the sources. We have different licensing agreements. Uh, apps, please contact us. We're happy to talk to you. I think it was part of it was data that's publicly available, but part of the model is trained on data sets with different licensing uh, caveats. So happy to have a detailed conversation with you, Mike, if you want to partner on that. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Vic. So I think our time is up. I really want to give you a cordial thank you. It was most interesting. Also, thank you for all these uh, uh, ideas for partnership. We'll definitely pursue all this and have our discussion among ourselves. And I know you have to go to your major meeting right away. So I, I have to uh, release you. But thanks on behalf of everybody. It was uh, super interesting. Thank much you, Mark. The, the pleasure was mine. And I very much appreciate this privilege and this honor of presenting to your department and the colleagues. And I really uh, mean it sincerely. Please contact us. We have a great team of uh, folks on our partnership uh, team that are going to work with you to see how we can co-create uh, the conditions for a win-win. So Mark, I, as I mentioned before, I hope it's the first, certainly not the last of uh, such meetings. Thank you.